Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, in the middle, I want to start with you. Um, so I can imagine a story that would say this is an extraordinary time for small businesses, an extraordinarily good time to start a business. I mean, the consumer is extremely strong, wages are high, oil prices are low, rates are low, so it could be easy to get capital, and mortgage rates being low means that consumers have more discretionary money maybe to spend at a restaurant or spend to buy some tchotchke. Um, <laughs> when you talk to your members, do they give you this very selective, rosy picture that I've just described, or do they also see some dark sides uh, in, in the economy right now? Uh, we, we have a, kind of a good, positive story to tell. Chosh key sales are good. <laughs> um, our, our members are reporting uh, good news. There is a, optimism is near record highs. Um, businesses are continuing to grow and invest within their business. Capital spending is up. They're trying to hire new employees. Uh, and and it, it, now there are some impediments there, but they're also raising pay as a result of those impediments. Their, their number one problem right now is just finding qualified employees. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a really interesting point because for so long during the recovery, as I've been writing about the macro economy, just for year after year after year, we kept saying jobs are growing, but wages aren't. Jobs are growing, but wages aren't. But suddenly, like, wage growth has been pretty strong for the last two, three, four years, and we're actually seeing, as, as I read the data, the strongest wage growth in industries that tend to be low income. So wage growth is pretty strong at the bottom. I can see on the one hand, this is a fantastic news for the country overall. It's a great news for workers. But I wonder if it's also difficult for some of the companies that you talk to, because if they are in a low wage industry, they're dealing with wages that are rising really quickly. Yeah, and, and to respond to that, you know, they, they are increasing compensation, increasing wages. They're taking out a lot of the training themselves. Uh, as I said, finding qualified employees is the number one problem. We say more than one in four businesses are having trouble filling open positions. The fact that they have open positions is good. Filling them is the problem. Um, so they're taking on the training themselves. And that presents challenges, but also opportunities. Yeah. Ron, you represent and speak with a lot of black business owners and black entrepreneurs. What are some of the obstacles that you see remaining in this economy? It's strengths, tchotchke strengths notwithstanding. <laughs> If you ask any small business owner their number one concern, they will say access to capital. But if you ask a black business owner what their number one, number two, and number three concern will be access to capital. And so it's great to be here with PayPal this afternoon because we're really talking about affordable, accessible, and really technology-driven access to capital. Because it's not just having access to the capital. My community is saying the cost of that capital mm -hmm. is extremely affordable. If I have a 700 credit score, I own my own home, I own my own business, I can go to the bank and two things will happen. One, I'll go in needing $100,000 and nine times out of 10, I'm going to leave with $40,000, one. Second, if I do get blessed enough with the $40,000, and as a community, we have been very creative. And so we feel like we can make it work with the $40,000, understanding that nine out of 10 businesses fail. And most of the reason, because they don't have enough capital to be able to overcome any obstacles. But secondly, and most importantly, if I do get the loan, if I do get credit, I'm paying twice the rate of my white peer. Mm. The average white person is paying around 9.9% .9 interest, whereas the Afri African American is paying over 20% for that same credit line. So not only am I being forced to take less, being forced to do more with it, mm. and I have to pay twice the rate for it. Mm. So the challenges for businesses is yes, there's the opportunity to grow, contracts are there, but the affordable capital is the thing that we're still facing as a community. Yeah, racial discrimination is, is a social issue, not a technological issue. And I don't want to be a tech Pollyanna right. and saying, oh, this is a problem that tech is just going to solve. But I am curious if you do see either tech companies or other sort of, you know, fintech entrepreneurs that are trying to solve this racial discrimination problem with new tools. That's a great question. If you really look at the African-American community, only about 40% of them have a banking relationship. Part of that is because of location. There aren't banks in our communities. Part of it is because of the fact that if I make a deposit in a traditional local bank, in black bank, banks don't make money when you make a deposit. Banks make money when you take a loan out. So in our communities where loans aren't affordable and aren't accessible, our businesses aren't there, our communities aren't there. And so the technology plays a huge role 
as there are more ally type banks that are existing. So I don't have to have a brick and mortar to have a banking relationship. And so the technology that is being created, such as a PayPal, is all good news for the black business owners. And last question to you about sort of the relationship between the black business owners and technology. I imagine that some of this is sort of a, a, a supply problem. You need, you need tech in order to, you know, you know, essentially have the digital bank and have that presence there. But I feel like you also need those black business owners or any business owner to know about the opportunity to take out the loan from that kind of bank. It becomes sure. sort of an information marketing problem. How do you get the word out that this is a way that they can take capital? That's a great question uh, to end on. The U.S. Black Chamber started in 2009 with six chambers. Today we have over 143. We're announcing our 144th chamber this afternoon. So for us, it really is about communication downward. Things that happen in Washington, D.C. and large cities many times does not get told to that local business owner. And because of the chamber network that we have, a lot of that communication is now reaching those persons that need it the most. That's great. Christy, uh, I just moved from uh, Manhattan. Um, I did a lot of uh, research on the Manhattan uh, business sort of makeup. Uh, Christian Wakefield had a report that they shared with me showing that a plurality of new businesses opening in Manhattan for the last three years have been restaurants and bars. Just restaurants and bars, restaurants and bars, restaurants and bars. And number two, the fastest growing segment after restaurants and bars um, is uh, fitness centers. So people are eating, they're working out, they're eating, they're working out. I somewhat loathsomely called this in an article, actually I believe my editor cut this, the munch and crunch economy. Um, that is not caught on, but if any of you feel the need to help it catch on, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, please uh, just don't uh, source me because it's uh, an embarrassing uh, pun or rhyme. Uh, do you see a similar, uh, I won't use the rhyme, a similar restaurant and fitness phenomenon happening in Washington, D.C. And if not, what are the, if I'm the kind of person who wants to start a new business in D.C. and I just want to ask you, what's hot right now? Like, wh what, what is their demand for? What is it? Well, you know, I think that Washington, D.C. used to be a, a government town, and we're no longer just a government town. You know, we are certainly a food town, and I think we see a lot of hot food trends coming out of Washington, D.C. So my former business was a food truck, and we see a big food truck industry here in Washington, D.C. that's burgeoning. But we do see the restaurants coming and going a lot here. Um, I think that the the cocktail scene is also really, really hot. And we have a lot of mixologists out here making a name for themselves. Um, people follow their mixologists from bar to bar to bar. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it is true, I think that you see the CrossFit and the Orange Theories and the other things moving. I think we, we have those same trends, but I mean, honestly, the entrepreneurial spirit is widespread. And whenever you see that gap of something that's interesting, you can find it here in Washington, D.C. So whether it is a bar or food or those third space establishments, I think we have have, we've got all of those interesting elements here in our in our economy. Yeah. When I was reporting on the restaurant scene in New York, the idea that kept coming up is that even though overall restaurant spending was growing really healthily, the number of businesses was growing faster because they were failing. And so you had just this enormous amount of churn that was happening in you know, the East Village, the Upper East Side, various in, throughout Brooklyn, various places that I lived. And on the one hand, churn's kind of cool. Churn is you know, the capitalist spirit. Churn is new ideas coming in. But churn also means the death of a lot of businesses, which is not only sad for those business owners, but it might also be sad for their communities. So what is the situation with restaurant churn and small business churn that we're seeing right now in DC? Well, I think that churn can seem exciting, and if people are rebranding their restaurants, that's one thing. But I think a lot of times it does mean that people's businesses have failed, because something has to close for something to open. And you know, at DSLBD, the Department of Small Local Business Development, we try to make sure that we are helping people grow and thrive and prosper. And sometimes you need capital, right? I want to say that you know Mayor Bowser has infused uh, her vision for a relentless pursuit of a fair shot for all Washingtonians. And access to capital is a big thing for restaurateurs, for all people. You know, we really worked hard. And last year at DSLBD, we worked with our local CDFIs. I mean, 
non-traditional non lenders in the black community and other communities are really the linchpin sometimes for that help. This summer, we were excited to be able to celebrate 1.5, a little bit over 1.5, but they won't let me say more than 1.5, <laughs> million dollars in loans in the pockets of small businesses, many of them east of the river, many of them into businesses that were run by people of color. And that was because we funded loan loss reserves into CDFIs that enabled them to take $200,000 and you know, 7.5 times, leverage that 7.5 times. Yeah. I think we need to make sure that our small businesses are getting the capital that they need in a timely fashion. And we need to make sure that we're, you know, we celebrate that churn, of course, but then we also need to make sure that we're helping the businesses that have invested in communities, help them stay, help them make sure that as the economy changes, as the marketplace changes, that we can help them pivot to whatever that next thing is. So that if you had one type of food and maybe you need a, maybe you need a salad option, mm -hmm. maybe you need to do what the next thing is. Maybe you need to get on Grubhub. Maybe you need to make sure you're partnering and mashing up with other people. Because the thing that is exciting about the market is it is always evolving. Mm -hmm. And so you need to know what those other things are and then help make that step so that when things are evolving, you're evolving with them and not watching them evolve beyond you. Kevin, I, I don't want to pretend that the only kind of small businesses that are growing are, you know, Sweet Green and Equinox. But, you know, one th interesting fact kind of links them. You know, if you look at sort of fast casual and uh, uh, cocktail bars and restaurants and fitness centers and new spin class places, <laughs> none of them compete with Amazon. <laughs> and it seems to me like if you want a really quick way to understand what kind of small businesses can grow in this economy, it's businesses that can't be swiftly digitized and then gobbled up by the large essentially e-commerce companies that are out there. Do you, first of all, uh, agree with, with that line of analysis that the kind of small businesses that do seem to be growing are, are those that can't be Amazon? Um, and two, what kind of small businesses do you see outside of DC sort of accelerating in their growth? Yeah, Amazon might tell you not yet, not competing yet, but uh, they, um, yeah. Yeah, but uh, they, uh, they, there are, Folks that are learning, or, or business owners that want to grow. Um, as I said, one of the problems they have with growing is, is filling those unfilled positions. Uh, once that's figured out, I think, I think it's good. I think they also learned some lessons from the last recession and they're trying to grow more slowly, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I know uh, access to capital certainly is, is an issue. Um, that may be also because of lessons learned mm -hmm. in the last recession. What, what we have found is during a recession, business owners' number one concern is uh, finding customers. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of demand. Now that dynamic has shifted a little bit, but what we also saw was that folks or businesses were growing less rapidly than perhaps they did the previous decade. So I think it's more of kind of a careful growth. Um, as far as competition goes, and, and you mentioned Amazon, I don't know the specific trends. I do know Amazon does present some opportunities with, with the marketplace. Sure. Also some challenges having to do with uh, some policies that emanate from DC, whether it's a, sup a Supreme Court decision on collecting and remitting sales taxes or uh, uh, counterfeiting and, and other variables, there, it, it does provide opportunities and obstacles. Right, and I, I certainly don't think that uh that the Amazon effect here is all bad. Because on the one hand, I think that the, the threat of competition probably is difficult for a lot of companies that are getting off the ground. It's certainly difficult for a lot of established companies like department stores to continue growing when Amazon is essentially a department st store in the sky. Um, but also that they clearly offer a digital platform that can allow sole proprietors, allow individual you know, makers to sell their stuff. Uh, Christy, can you talk a little bit about sort of the maker scene that we see here in Washington, D.C.? Oh, absolutely. We've got an amazingly creative maker scene in Washington. I mean, I think, so through Made in D.C. For those who might oh. not be familiar with the term makers, why don't you uh, So maker, that we, we call anyone who's, I mean, it's making things, right? So whether you're making earrings or belts or T-shirts and, you know, or art of any kind, we call them makers. And so there's like the creatives and sometimes it's music and sometimes it's, uh, sometimes even the experiences, if you get a little bit more esoteric about it. But the, so what, through Made in DC, we have this program where we try to create opportunities for people who make things to get access to the market. Mm -hmm. 
And through Made in DC, we actually did a partnership with the airport, where we have a kiosk there, and people who have Made in DC products are in terminal, between terminals B and C, and it's all Made in DC products, where they get tens of thousands of eyes on them to see things that are authentically made in DC. Um, that kiosk is outpacing every other kiosk of its type, type in the store. You know, I think people have DC pride, and they love to see things that are made here, like by people here. Um, and I think it also shows like to that other question of like, could Amazon just take it all away from us? Well, no, like sell it on Amazon, right. but also, you know, there are things that Amazon can never take away. Like Amazon cannot wash your hair. Amazon cannot mm -hmm. give you a pedicure. Amazon cannot walk your dog for you. Like there are things that Amazon will never take from you. And so I think that, you know, the, the creatives will always be here to like, make beautiful things for us and help us enjoy and celebrate our city. And like, we wanna help celebrate that and create opportunities to get that to the marketplace. And honestly, if getting that to the marketplace means also selling that on Etsy and Amazon, I'm all for it because we want our makers to make money so they have money to spend here in the district. And I think both can be great. Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, I think part of the challenge, and again, I'm speaking from my community, I just stated a fact that 40% of us have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. That means 60% of African Americans in this town don't have access to be able to participate in an, in an Amazon transaction. Mm -hmm. If you're saying that the only way I can buy a product from you is to have a credit card, and I'm telling you that more than half of us don't have credit cards, you're leaving out half of the customers in this town where at one time it was a majority minority community. And so I think, no, Amazon will never take all of the business here because most of the people here, a large percent of the people here, don't have the ability to be able to shop with an Amazon. No, that's, a, that's an important point. And it's, and it's not just Amazon. I mean, you see the growth of these sort of cashless businesses sort of throughout Ubers. the season. If I don't have credit, I can't use Uber. If I don't right. have or credit, Or even I fast yeah. casual restaurants where yeah. it says, you know, we're cashless now because we don't want the money to be stolen from, from the cash register. And on the one hand, I understand that security need, but at the same time, you're right. If you're essentially, you know, saying that half of the black population of this metro area can't shop here, I think that's a problem. Uh, the last question that I want to pose to the entire panel is a, is, a, is a paradox that I've thought about a lot over the last decade. And that's about millennial entrepreneurship, which was brought up uh, in, in another panel. On the one hand, it seems to me, as we sort of stated at the top, and, and, and Kevin, you sort of verified this, you have a situation where it's, it's better than ever, uh, than, or maybe not better than ever, better than any time maybe this century to start a small business. With, you know, the, the, the consumer is strong and wages are high and, um, and the cost of capital is low and uh, oil prices are low so people can spend a lot of money. But at the same time, the business formation rate has been declining decade over decade and it's still going down among a millennial generation that is really savvy about digital technology in a way that it, you might think it would make them more likely to be the kind of sole proprietor maker that you've talked about and to be able to sell your stuff online. Um, so last question for the panel, everyone's to take it. Wh why do we think business formation, entrepreneurship continues to decline among this younger generation? I, I have two sons. Um, one is 23, one is 24. Both of them have the entrepreneurial spirit. I tell them, don't do it. Wow. <laughs> uh, most of us know the data that says 90% of businesses fail within the first year. You're usually going to mess up your parents' credit. <laughs> You're gonna mess up your name as well as your parents' name. And from a black community, we don't get the second chance. Mm. If we fail that first business, it has shown that it will take you three years before you can re-energize a business concept to go back to get funded. Mm. And so for us, we tell our millennials, make that mistake on someone else's dime. <laughs> go find out how to become an entrepreneur while you're being an entrepreneur. If it means that you have to have a quote unquote side hustle, if that means that you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit, go volunteer for a small business owner. If that small business owner can't afford to hire you, bring the value that you have with the acumen and the new technology and new skills to a single business owner, bring that value and technology to them, grow that firm, and two things will more than happen. You will either earn yourself a job or a business. We know too many businesses that don't have a succession plan to pass that business on to because they don't have a relationship with millennials. I tell millennials, there aren't going to be a whole lot of new businesses, new concepts, but there's a whole lot of them that exist that don't have a next phase. But what you can bring to that 
business owner can allow them and you to have sustainability for years to come. That's great. That's one of the most interesting answers to that question I've ever heard. So we're <laughs> out of time, but thank you all very, very much, and please thank our panel.